Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we're taking a look at a particularly futuristic styled pistol. This is a Vector CP1. Now, Vector is a South African brand created in 1992, and it's a brand that was created by the Littleton Engineering Works. This was one of the predominant firearms manufacturing companies in South Africa at the time. And when this was put into development, Littleton already had a number of successful pistols under their belt. The Z88 and the SP1 were both essentially copies of the Beretta 92. They were both reasonably successful, they're good quality guns, they were in government use. And what happened in 1995 is that the South African police decided that they also, in addition to a service-sized copy of the Beretta 92, they also wanted a compact pistol, something that could be concealed, something that would be smaller and lighter, something along the lines of the Walther PP PPK or the Beretta 81 family. And so, uh, Littleton and Vector got into the competition to create just that pistol. Before we go any farther, I do want to give a big thanks to Guns.com for sponsoring today's video. They've got a bunch of cool inventory online to choose from if you're looking to buy a cool new gun. And by the way, they are participating in the ID.me program to identify and authenticate veterans and first responders to get them discounts from appropriate vendors. But they also have a really cool program set up for purchasing guns. So if you're hanging on to that old gun that's been lying around that you'd really like to get rid of, but you don't want to deal with setting up accounts and dealing with online auctions, or maybe you don't have a local gun shop handy that you'd like to sell to, or you just don't like their offer, well, you can sell it to guns.com. All you have to do is go to the page on the website, which I'll have linked in a tagged comment here, and uh, give them the basic information about what it is and a couple of pictures, send it off, and within a day or so they'll get back to you with an offer. If you like the offer, send you a shipping label, slap it on a box, mail it to them, and presto, money in your hands for whatever you need it for. Whether that's of course a cool new gun, or something else perhaps more responsible. Anyway, uh, like I said, big thanks to Guns.com for sponsoring today's video. Now, back to the CP1. When the competition for a new compact South African police pistol was announced, Vector actually only had about four months to put together their prototype. And they actually pulled that off, and in the process accomplished a number of firsts in South African firearms manufacture. This would be the first South African pistol made with a polymer frame, it was the first South African firearm designed completely via CAD, computer-aided drafting. That was a new thing in the 1990s. Uh, maybe a little surprising to people today to think about the fact that used to design guns on big sheets of paper with pencils, and the CP1 is exactly from that conversion period where people started using computer-aided drafting instead. Anyway, uh, for mechanical inspiration, Vector actually looked to the HK P7, and they decided to design this as a gas-delayed blowback pistol. It's also hammer-fired. Despite the look, you look at this and you assume that seems to be a striker-fired gun, that's how striker-fired guns usually appear. No, this actually has a concealed internal hammer. It's chambered for 9mm Parabellum, has 12 and 13 round magazines, it's a lightweight compact pistol, it had to be no more than one inch wide, and it isn't more than one inch wide, and it was designed very much with a snag-free, easy concealment sort of aesthetic to it. Now it's also important to point out here, uh, Vector designed the gun mechanically first, and then they turned over the prototype to a company called Panagraph, specifically to make it look cool. Also maybe to make it ergonomic, but mostly to make it look cool. If you've seen Vector's uh, CR1, their take on the bullpupped Galil, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. It's like they put the polymer in a melty pot and made all the square lines into curvy lines, and that's what gives it so much of this futuristic look. Now, once that process is complete, it turns out the South, South African police opted not to adopt the CP1. Instead they chose the Republic Arms uh, RAP401, which by the way I also have a video on, I have videos on a bunch of South African guns in the description below if you're interested in them. But without uh, the setup for a police sale, Vector was left kind of, well what do we do, and decided we'll just follow all the way through, we'll put this into production, and we'll sell it on the commercial market. And it turned out to actually be a pretty successful pistol for them. Maybe not successful in you know John Browning kind of terms, they weren't selling hundreds of thousands of these, but for Vector, for Littleton Engineering Works, this was a pretty decent investment. So let's take a look at how they how it actually works. Then we'll talk about what went wrong. To start with some markings here, we have Vector molded into the frame. 
Vector USA in Norfolk, Virginia was the company that Vector South Africa set up to do importation and distribution into the US. And by the way, it's worth pointing out, when they ultimately shut down this company, which we'll get into in a minute, uh, the last batch of guns had already been engraved for importation, but never actually left South Africa. And so they were sold in South Africa, and this has led to a few um, incorrect assumptions in South Africa that these guns were made in the US. Actually, they were all made in South Africa, just there was some confusion about import marks. On the left side we have Vector again on the frame, as well as CP1, Compact Pistol 1. A metal plate was molded into the frame underneath the muzzle with a serial number and made in RSA, that's Republic of South Africa. And that cool Vector logo on both sides of the grip, which does look a bit like the Evil Villains logo from any number of James Bond movies. A lot of the design choices on the CP1 were made in pursuit of a cool looking and very smooth snag free sort of design profile. So the magazine release is a good example. Uh, it looks ambidextrous, it's not, it's only activated on this side, and that button does not rise above the pistol at all. So you have to push that in and it will release the mag. It doesn't really pop it out, but it will fall free as long as there's not any dirt in there. There you go. There were, by the way, two versions of the magazine sold. One has this full grip, and that would give you 13 rounds. You'll notice this has markers at 5, 12, and 13, because the grip with or the magazine with the smaller pad, which was intended to make the gun a little bit smaller for carry, this would originally hold 12 rounds. So you only get one extra round with this larger uh, floor plate on the magazine. Now, for importation into the US, these were imported during the assault weapons ban, and so the American magazines are all limited to 10 rounds, and you can see that from the crimp right there. So original South African mag, US import mag, and these are marked with 5 and 10 round capacities. Now the manual safety here is an M1 Garand style of manual safety, where this is in the safe position and you push it forward with your trigger finger till the red shows and then it's ready to fire. People will look at this and say, oh what a horrible idea, like you have to put your finger in the trigger guard in order to deactivate the safety. That's true, but it's also worth considering that the holsters that were designed for the Vector were intended to actually engage the safety automatically when you put the gun in the holster. This, the safety lever here would hit the front of the holster, automatically engage the safety, and especially for a police oriented gun, that's not a bad idea. So yeah, pros and cons to this. One of the reasons people often will assume that this is a striker fired pistol, aside from not being able to see a hammer, is that it has a trigger safety on it, which is something that we're used to seeing on striker fired guns, but they went ahead and put that on as a redundant safety here anyway. And it's a little bit unusual in how it works. You can see there's a little peg on the side of the trigger, and if I try to pull the trigger without depressing that red button, that little peg hits the side of the frame and it stops the trigger from moving. When I press this button it will actually slide that peg to the side, so it can now, the trigger can now go all the way into the frame, and on this side there's a little square cut out there. So the peg actually is just slid from coming out the left to coming out the right where it's not obstructed. So that's the trigger safety. They put this polymer sort of end cap on the gun, that's got the rear sight on it, these are very deep but somewhat narrow sights, a little bit unusual, and because this rear polymer end cap is totally un unchangeable, you can't zero anything there, instead the front sight is zeroable. You have a locking screw there, unscrew that, and you can slide the front sight left and right to zero. Disassembly is kind of cool, you actually use the safety. So where some pistols, especially striker fired pistols today, require you to pull the trigger first, the CP1 is kind of the opposite end of the spectrum. You have to engage the safety, and then you actually pull it back a little bit more. It's under spring pressure here. Pull it back all the way, and then, like a lot of this style of gun, like the, the Walther PP, like the Makarov, you can then lift a slide up off the back, slide it forward, and take it off. Got a recoil spring that normally nests around the barrel there. We have, if you haven't seen my video on gas delayed pistols, well this is a very distinctive element of gas delayed blowback pistols, that's the gas piston. Moving on to the frame for a moment, we have our gas cylinder on the bottom. There's a small hole that goes from just in front of the brass case into that 
gas cylinder. Uh, as soon as you fire, gas pressure bleeds into that cylinder, which pushes forward on the gas piston here, which holds the slide forward until the bullets clear the barrel. Then that gas pressure dissipates, and the inertia of the barrel moving back allows it to cycle. So pretty basic gas delay blowback operation there. This is our hammer back here. Drop that down gently, that's what that looks like. Hammer spring back there. This guy right here is the ejector that sits just over the top of the magazine. So the slide's going to pull a case back, it'll hit that and knock the, uh, the empty case out of the gun. And then we have this little piece here, which is the disconnector. So once you have the trigger pulled, the slide is going to push that down, which disconnects the trigger, so that it is only semi-automatic. Now up here in the slide, we have this big open recess, which is where the hammer operates. This is kind of like a Colt 1903 pocket hammerless, in that there is a hammer, but it's hidden inside the gun. And on the original version, we have this really kind of cheesy little flat spring here. It's really a fairly light spring. And this is the hammer, or the, the firing pin block. So this is intended to prevent the firing pin from coming all the way forward unless this spring is pushed up, which doesn't take that much force. And the idea is that when the hammer comes up, the hammer actually hits that and pushes, pushes it out of the way and then allows the firing pin to move all the way forward. So kind of a, a interesting way to do that, a little non-standard. And there you go, that, that's it. That's field stripped. You just take the slide and the spring and the magazine out and you're done. Good to clean, put the gun back together. Production starts in 1995. The pistol starts selling pretty well. It's modern, it's futuristic. It is, turns out that it works primarily with FMJ. Uh, it has some issues with hollow point ammunition, but in South Africa, the typical ammunition people are using is PMP 115 grain uh, full metal jacket. And so these reliability issues don't come up. Eventually they would, when the gun starts being exported to the United States and other places where people are going to be using a bit more diverse sorts of ammunition. And so there's actually a program to redesign the gun a bit, which gets very little press, where it was essentially redesigned from being a controlled feed pistol to a push feed pistol. I have a video also on the difference between those things. Basically it's a question of when does the extractor actually hook over the cartridge. And by making it push feed where the extractor snaps over the cartridge just as the round is chambered, they were able to alter the angle of feed a bit and get better reliability with hollow point ammunition. But that went okay. That's not the thing that was really a problem for them. The problem for them came in the year 2000 when it came to light that there was a hidden flaw in the CP1 design that if you dropped it on the back end of the gun or hit it on the back end of the gun, it was actually possible for it to fire without the trigger being pulled. The infamous drop safety failure that has uh, been a problem for so many different manufacturers, uh, really actually quite a lot of manufacturers. When you look at handgun recalls, it's usually some form of drop safety. This turns out to be a fairly difficult thing to really thoroughly test for. In late 2000, moving into early 2001, Vector has to deal with this problem. What they do is they recall the pistols. They come up with a fix, which we'll take a look at in just a moment, and uh, you send your gun back to Vector and they'll fix it and send it back to you. But they also offer to just cut you a check and keep your pistol, because Vector starts looking at this and realizing this is just a pain. Like we don't want to deal with this, we're concerned about the American market. This is also the time period where it's looking like uh, it may become possible in the United States for a victim of crime to sue the manufacturer of a firearm that they may have been shot with. Um, think of this, and this presented a massive liability risk to firearms manufacturers. Imagine if someone ran into you in a car and you could sue the car maker for the actions. It's, well, ultimately uh, laws would be passed to prevent that sort of lawsuit, but around 2000-2001 that was really up in the air. And between that and the recall, Vector decided they were just going to get out of the United States market. So Vector USA, their distribution offshoot was folded up, and the company essentially disappeared. So the $500 check that they would give you to just buy back your CP1 was in some cases more than people had actually paid for the guns, and there were actually a lot of takers for this deal. Some people did have their guns fixed and returned to them, but a lot of them just sold the gun back to Vector, and as a result, CP1s are relatively uncommon in the US today. Now 
I happen to have a repaired post-recall example of the CP1 as well, so let's pull this apart and let me show you what they did to fix it. Sometimes drop safety issues are the result of a bad trigger mechanism, but in this case, and really in most cases, the problems that lead to drop safety issues are lack of an adequate firing pin block, something that prevents the firing pin from just moving under inertia if the gun gets hit or dropped. And as it turns out, this rather unorthodox sort of flat spring design on the CP1 wasn't up to the task. And so what Vector did is they got rid of it, you can see there's still a pin and a cutout for it there, uh, but they added a more traditional plunger style uh, trigger block. So as long as, well there's a spring in this plunger, and as long as it is pushed down like that, there, uh, well the firing pin is held in place and can't go far enough forward to protrude and fire a cartridge. So uh, Vector added this, and if you remember this little disconnector nub on the trigger bar, well the new version added this finger as well, and its job when the trigger is pulled backward is for it to simply come back, hit this little angled part here, and push that firing pin blocking plunger up into the slide so that the gun can fire. So fixing this oopsie you can accidentally fire it by dropping it problem required a number of new parts. They had to create the blocking plunger here, a new firing pin to match it, and a new trigger bar also to work with the system. While we're here I do want to point out that this example is actually not a gun that was originally imported into the US. This is import marked by Century, and it actually has an original South African proof mark, which my early example here does not have. And it also has a South African proof on the, uh, the barrel housing there, and the back of the barrel itself. Those are Springbok antlers, by the way, that is the style of the South African proof mark at the time. From the very beginning one of the complaints about the CP1 was the quality of the trigger, which it's not terrible but it's kind of heavy. Uh, especially considering it's a single action hammer fired trigger, you might expect it to be really nice, but it's it's okay. Well the, the fix to the, the recall issue by adding in that heavier uh, plunger spring in the firing pin block definitely made the trigger irk a little bit heavier and definitely not as good. So if you want one of these as a shooter, well, maybe you want the early one and just make sure not to drop it. Unfortunately for Vector, the safety recall ended up overshadowing everything else about this pistol. What could have been a pretty decent pistol. Fixed barrel, accurate, gas delayed blowback, light recoil, modern, cool, futuristic looking, ends up being best known as like that South African gun that has catastrophic safety issues that forced it to be recalled. That's really not what you're going for as a, as a manufacturer. There were a number of other rarer variations on these. Uh, you could get this with a chrome slide instead of blackened, and I believe some of those actually did make it into the US. That was a production item. Uh, because it's a polymer frame it wasn't that big a deal to make different colored frames, and so there were a variety of different colors made in very small numbers. I believe all of those were sold just in South Africa. There was a, an extended threaded barrel option for a suppressor, apparently they made 20 of those for one particular client, I don't think any of those ever got into the US. And then ultimately there was going to be a CP2 follow-up pistol, and it was going to have an ambidextrous thumb safety on it, and it was going to be available in 40 Smith & Wesson in addition to 9mm. They ultimately made two prototypes of those, one in each caliber. The gun was apparently quite unpleasant to shoot in 40 because of the lightweight frame, the gas delayed system, and the higher pressure cartridge, and that whole program got cancelled. So ultimately early 2000s the CP1 falls out of production, obviously disappears from the US market circa 2001, and they're well, they still get used to this day in movies and television shows where someone wants a particularly sleek, fancy, futuristic looking gun, but that's kind of the extent of what they're known for today. Well, hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. A big thanks once again to Guns.com for being today's sponsor. If you're looking to sell that gun you've had lying around, definitely check them out. I'll put a link in a pinned comment below. Thanks for watching.